Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. On behalf of everyone at the Center for International Development, I'd like to welcome you. Um, we are going to be recording tonight's program and posting it online. So I just want to notify everyone in the room that your presence here is, in effect, permission to be broadcast. So without further ado, I'd like to invite onto the stage um, the director of CID, Asim Khwaja. Um, um, thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I always think in life the most precious thing we have is time. Uh, and the fact that you guys are here, you're sharing your gift of time with us. Uh, we hope this will be worth your while. Uh, I am definitely fascinated to listen to Michael. Um, I've listened to him for years, but I still can't get enough of him. And so I hope this will be at least some sense of that. I have two very simple roles today. I'll be very quick because I don't want to stand in front of the main attraction. Um, the first is just to introduce the Center for International Development. Um, we are based at the Kennedy School, uh, but we, we very much uh, feel like our mission is to service the entire community. That ranges everywhere from undergraduate students all the way up to senior faculty across all the schools. And so I'd encourage you, uh, if you haven't been involved in our events, we'll be doing a lot more of these events. Uh, this is just a fabulous space, so thank you uh, for, for the space organizers for this space. But you'll be seeing a lot of events from us. Um, there are several series of events. Hopefully, you've all signed up on our mailing list. Please follow that. Uh, we'll send you uh, events there. We have a Friday series, which is awesome, where we have leading practitioners every week. It's a great chance for you to meet uh, some of the leading academics and practitioners in the field. You can also follow us on, on sort of social media um, uh, and the like. Um, the second role, uh, which is really close to my heart, is to introduce someone I deeply respect and care about, um, Michael Kramer. So I'm going to have Michael come up to the stage. Uh, so before Michael begins, I'm going to embarrass him, because uh, uh, it's fun. Uh, um, it, you know, look, you, can, you know about Michael when you read his work, and I think you, you we often, as academics, tend to see each other as researchers, as walking resumes or walking CVs. And when you take that approach to Michael, what you see is spectacular. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the Michael I know and the Michael I've had the chance to kind of learn from, Michael was my advisor, by the way, uh, in my PhD. I did my PhD here, and he was one of my advisors. And, and I wanted to share uh, a few things about Michael from that experience. Michael doesn't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> so Michael's probably like, oh, no. Um, but I think it's important to realize that because it's important to realize as, as much as we're driven by the passions that we have, intellectual passions or scholarship passions, um, we very much are more driven and deeply driven by the emotional objectives that we have. We all came into this field, into development, because we truly, deeply care. Often as academics, what happens is that discourse gets hidden. When we present our papers, you end, you end up seeing data and numbers and statistics, but you don't realize that what gets up, us up every morning is not that, uh, is the chance that we have, the opportunity that we have to make a difference in the world, and that is something we all share. Whether you're a, a freshman, whether you're a professor, whether you're a Nobel laureate, or uh, Larry's here, whether you're the president of the university, any one of us um, has that passion we share. Um, and that's, I think, the essence of who we are. Michael, when you take that view of Michael, literally typifies that, right? Um, and that's the part of Michael which, uh, you know, when I was a PhD student, I remember, you know, sort of, you know, I feel like the biggest gift you can give someone in time and also is, is intellectual guidance, right? Um, when you're trying to figure out what you want to do in life, whatever it is, Right? That's some of the most profound moments in your life. And those individuals who make a difference, and you all know those individuals, you've all experienced those individuals, are individuals you will never forget in your life, wherever you are, however successful you are. Michael is that for me, and is that for many people. There are many in the room who would say that. There are many others who are not in the room today who would say that. And that's just spectacular. So I just wanted us to acknowledge someone like Michael. Forget the Nobel for a second. Just on that. Uh, I think is just worthwhile recognizing Michael for who he is. Uh, so Michael, I wanted to personally thank you for that. The second thing about Michael is Michael will never admit this, but Michael is out there to save the world. Uh, he literally is, 
all right? Um, Michael is one of the few academics I know who creates global public goods. Global public goods. There are many examples. You can look at his CV. I won't embarrass him further by saying that. That's unusual. That's unusual for an academic to be at the top of their career, but still take time out, very precious time, and do things which are chlorinating the world, vaccinating the world, just deeply, deeply concerned about making an impact off his work. And that's another reason I want to recognize Michael at a very personal level from guiding intellectual journeys to a really global level of addressing. Uh, and by the way, these aren't necessarily things that he was recognized for his Nobel for. So I just want to be clear, right? There are many facets to Michael which we should celebrate in addition to what we're celebrating today. So with that, Michael, thank you for sharing time with us. Over to you. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you very much, Hassan. I, I really appreciate that. And uh, let me just say, uh, uh, you know, I've learned a tremendous amount from you. And you know, one of the, one of the, and you, you, I, maybe you deliberately didn't mention this, but we first met at at, uh, at MIT. Or am I allowed to say that? Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, so when Hassan was an undergraduate, and you know, from it's been a pleasure. Uh, working together when, uh, when you were an undergrad, when you were a grad student, and now when you're a colleague. And I, you know, I, would, I would say that you know, one of the, you know, going beyond awesome, you know, a great thing about Harvard is you learn every day from, you know, I learn from my colleagues, I learn from graduate students, you know, just sitting in the in the development lunch, uh, for, for those of you who are grad students, you'll know what this means, development tea. And I learn from, I teach a freshman seminar. And you know, I learn from the students in the freshman seminar who bring a very pre fresh pr uh, perspective to things. And you know, often, you know, you know, just working on a paper with a, a, a student in a freshman seminar who's, who's you know, now just graduated, but we worked together when he was in, in undergrad. So it's just a, this is a, a wonderful place, and I'm very grateful to you know, all of colleagues and, and students in the economics department and at the Center for International Development. Um, you know, on the, on the, you know, Asim asked me to say a little bit about how I got involved in international development, and uh, I think I agree with him that many of us in the field, and, and you know, this was a very fortunate to have been recognized uh, for the work along with Esther and Abhiji. We all, you know, we all feel this way, but really we all know that this is the work of an entire field, and, and that includes many, many people, researchers in this area, but also this type of work requires, and I think it's part of what makes it uh, exciting and makes it intellectually interesting, it requires and, and naturally um, naturally um, is suited to involvement of teams of people, teams of people with very different backgrounds. So across uh, subject matter areas, so economists, but also public health specialists, or education specialists, or psychologists, you know, depending on the project. But also, it involves very deep interaction with, um, with the people, government workers who, are, who are, have problems that they are motivated to try to solve, or NGO workers or people in a business. And then with the, you know, with the whoever the ultimate uh, clients of this are, whether that's you know, students in a school or farmers, and you get insights from, uh, and working in this field from all of those people and enumerators, it requires a lot of, you know, awesome as you're referring to global public goods, but it requires infrastructure organizations like JPAL or IPA or CID, um, and, um, and that, you know, I think we, what's perhaps unusual about this field is I think we all feel that we're working towards a common goal. And yeah, I don't want to claim there's never, you know, uh, you know, professional, you know, people aren't, uh, aren't, uh, aren't unmotivated by, by other things, but we do, I think at the end of the day in this field, recognize that we've got common objectives and that's wonderful. So, okay. So Awesome had asked me to say a little bit about how I got involved in the field. So let me uh, say a bit about that. I just wanted to respond to, to the wonderful, your wonderful introduction. So I was an, I, I'd been interested in 
international development and cared about it. And it's not just interest in it, as Asim said. You know, it's embarrassing to say in some ways. I don't know why we feel embarrassed, but I cared about this issue. And I know, you know Esther and Abhijit, uh, the, the co-laureates, uh, co um, feel the same way. These, this is a, I think that's in part because of how I was raised as a child by my parents to that we have certain obligations um, when there are injustices in the world to try to help address them. And um, you know, I think that's, that's I, I, as I said later, I spent time in Kenya, but it wasn't, oh, I spent time in Kenya and then I got interested in this. It was because this was an issue that I cared about that I spent time in Kenya. So, then, um, so I, I, I was a social studies concentrator uh, as an undergraduate, benefited immensely from that, that program. I think one of the things that people who work in this field very quickly realize is the uh, interdisciplinary nature of the problems. And you know, social studies for me was, was very helpful because uh, exposure to a, a lot of different fields and, um, and, um, and different ways of, of thinking about issues as well as to the great thinkers who, who you know, one reads in social studies. But I took you know, more economics classes over time and I took a, a class in which by um, so somebody, the precursor to CID, Harvard Institute for International Development, who worked in Kenya and, um, and you know, through him, I, I guess I maybe should uh, say that I applied for a, I did senior thesis research on a, some programs in India and Sri Lanka, and I applied for funds uh, to go do re research for a senior thesis over the summer, as many, I assume many of you will. And I, I, I got the funds, and I very diligently you know, went to Sri Lanka, and I went to the, you know, the library and the government offices to look up the records on this, on this program and diligently you know, wrote them all down, and then at the end of that summer, got a, got a chance to go visit a village and realized I'd been wasting my time the rest of the, uh, the uh, and waste, that's maybe too strong, but I, I'd been missing out uh, the rest of the summer. And so having done that, I realized it was important for me to spend more time, if I wanted to work in this field, to spend more time in developing countries. So I, um, I, I in this class, I met uh, uh, John Cohen, who's, who's, um, who's uh, unfortunately, has died uh, uh, between then and now. I also met my fellow students in the class, and um, and and through actually as much through my my classmates as as through John Cohen, um, was able to arrange to spend some time in Kenya. And I was originally only planning to you know, spend a few weeks there and then come back and get a job. But I I was called to the. Kenya was not a, a democracy at that point. Um, and I was called to the office of the head of the local government, and I thought I might be in trouble. Um, uh, but he told me he was starting three schools and asked if I would teach at one of them, based on zero qualifications, I should say. Um, <laughs> but um, the, I, 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 I did wind up teaching there and wound up spending a year. And then, um, then at that time, um, and it's changed radically since, but um, there were a lot of Kenyan schools that, and that were interested in, in bringing in teachers and, uh, from overseas and looked for somebody to replace me. This was a brand new school, not, not, didn't have, have much, uh, much money, and so they were, they were looking for volunteers where they could find them. And it turned out there was a lot of interest among Harvard undergraduates. Um, I, I originally wrote to the social studies program and to, to, uh, to my house, and realizing there was so much interest on each side, um, set up an organization called World Teach to help, help match, uh, um, you know, match Harvard, well, uh, quickly grew beyond Harvard students uh, uh, with, um, with uh, schools in Kenya. Kenya then actually rapidly transitioned to a point where they were producing plenty of teachers and um, we started working in other areas. Um, so how, that, that's, but, the time that I spent in Kenya really deepened my interest in development and made me uh, appreciate the importance of, of being involved you know, on the ground. Um, after, um, some people have asked, how did I get involved in, in RCTs? And, um, and so in graduate school, I studied development, but I studied it from the point of view of economic growth, so macroeconomics. And 
Robert Barrow, some of you may know, was, uh, was my advisor. So he's uh, contributed many fields of macroeconomics, but including uh, the, the study of economic growth. And so this was almost the opposite approach. Um, this was very much driven by theory, thinking about very big picture questions. And I think that's, you know, I feel like that's a very important part of training. And I, sometimes people create a false opposition between uh, you know, microeconomic work uh, um, and macro. And you know, I, I see them both as very much part of the same picture. So after, after graduating, I, I got a job at MIT, started earning a real salary went back to Kenya to visit some friends of mine um, who, and um, just on vacation with, with my wife, or um, uh, Rachel Glenister, who's very active in this field and was uh, head of the Poverty Action Lab at, at MIT, um, so was, you know, played a huge role in this field as well. So we, we were visiting a, a Kenyan friend of mine who'd been a headmaster of a school when I was teaching, but ha had gone on to work for a very small NGO. And they were starting work in a new area of Kenya where they hadn't worked before. And they were, wanted to work in schools, but they didn't, they didn't know, um, you know, they were considering a bunch of different ways of working. And as we talked about it, they agreed to, that they, they wanted to explore um, how, how to, how to most operate most effectively. And what they decided to do was to try different programs in different areas. And because they were just starting and they needed to phase in gradually, to, to time the phase in in a way and structure the phase in so they had comparable groups of schools that were phased in early and phased in later. So that meant that partway through, you could compare the schools that had already got a particular program to, other, to others that, that hadn't. And of course, this is, um, you know, this is uh, it might seem like basic logic to do something like this. Um, but this you know, was not this common at the time. It's a simp you know, very simple approach and obviously used in medicine and many other fields. It's, it's proven to have a huge impact in the field, uh, this approach. And I think that's, when I got involved, I was interested in it primarily from the standpoint of getting stronger evidence and more reliable evidence. And when you try to statistically control for various factors, to isolate the impact of a program. That's very hard. And a lot of work that was going on in the field suggested that we weren't as successful as that as we were trying. And this seemed like a way to, to get at that. But I think what's turned out to be the case over, the, over time is that in addition to any benefits from the better causal inference, um, there's a whole, there are other very important aspects of this. Because it naturally involves something that hadn't been standard for economists up till then. There's certainly some economists who were doing it, but economists tended to either do models with paper and pencil or to analyze data sets. And I think that's, you know, those are both very valuable approaches, but there's also something to be gained by the richer interactions that, that you get that I was describing earlier when you're talking to farmers, to teachers, to students, when you're talking to government officials and people in NGOs. And that brings in all sorts of new insights. And I'm you know, happy to discuss some examples of that uh, later on if, pe if people want. So the other aspect of this, I think, is, is relevant and in some ways different than what many economists thought they were doing or claimed to be doing. You know, we, like, we like to pretend we're scientists. Um, and, uh, and, we, um, we, and so we emphasize you know, trying to understand things. And, and, but the truth is that not just in development, but in many fields of economics, people are motivated because they care about social issues. And partly what we're doing is we are trying to understand the world, but we're also trying, often trying to innovate and trying to come up with approaches to solve uh, problems that human beings are facing and that can make the world a better place. And um, you know, the, the recent Nobel Prize to Al Roth is a theorist. Um, he developed algorithms for matching. They're used for medical residency matches for those of you who are from the med school. Um, and, but are also used for, he's now, work, he's now developed techniques to use this for matching kidneys for people who need kidneys and people, people who are willing to donate them. And you know, that's an example from a very different field of actually approaching practical problems and trying to, trying to address them. And that involves what's, I think, one of the exciting things about 
about this whole movement of randomized trials in, in economics is people are, and they're open about it now, they're trying to, to innovate, come up with new, new approaches, test them, go through this process of, you know, these used to be called, including by me, randomized evaluations. But they're not just evaluations that you do at the end of the project cycle. Think of these like, often they're beta testing. They're trying new ideas. You don't get it right at first. You tweak it, you change it, you realize you're going the entirely wrong direction, you try a new approach. And over time, you know, I think we've made a lot of progress as a field. And I, again, I'll, uh, let me, I'll stay abstract now, but very happy to give examples. Um, We've, we've, made, we've understood things about the world that allowed policies to be improved, but we've, and we've also come up with, for particular problems, innovative ways of, of doing things that are, are now um, starting to make a, a difference to people's lives. So maybe what I should, why don't I, I you know, pause now, happy to, you know, awesome or others if you have questions, but I'd love to open it up to the, to the group and if, you know, uh, and, also happy to talk about particular examples. Great. So uh, we suggested that Michael, uh, several people submitted online uh, questions. Uh, that's great. Um, there's a lot of research showing that when you do that, you get more diversity and, and better balance when you do that. So we typically encourage that. Why don't we start with um, the ambassadors asking some of the online questions that were submitted uh, uh, to Michael, and then Michael, if you could respond to them. And then we're just going to open up uh, questions broadly to the audience. I realize that people are at different levels, and so we're going to try and not discriminate on levels. Um, we'll try and reach people at higher levels as well. Uh, but why don't we start maybe first with the online one? Do you want to go ahead? Great. Academically, RCTs in developing countries have been a striking success, as evidenced by your Nobel in economics this year. Practically, what would you say is the most striking success story of RCTs in terms of economic development? Did the poster child of development, China, use RCTs to become rich? Great, okay, thanks. Um, let, me, let me take the first part of that question of you know, what's come out of RCTs. And um, um, let me start with an example, and then I'll, I will come to the China question, because I think it's extremely interesting. And um, the, so the, I think there, as I was saying earlier, we can, I think two things can come out of, out of any economic research, but including RCTs, and, I, and um, which one is understanding of the world, which can maybe shape policies you know, more broadly, and the other is you know, specific innovation. So let me talk about uh, understanding. You know, when, um, in the 90s, um, when I started doing work in this field, um, there was a widespread view among it, many policymakers. Um, this ranged from NGOs, like the uh, NGO with which I was working, um, to all the way up to the World Bank, um, that it was very important, to, it wasn't a good idea to give away things for free. And by the way, this, this view persists. Um, and because if you gave things away for free, people wouldn't value them, they wouldn't use them properly, that um, and also that it was important for sustainability, financial sustainability, to raise money. So people applied this to a wide range of, of, of areas. One area that I um, was an uh, area that I researched um, you know, fairly early on was treatment for intestinal worms. So may not be on a few pets, you may be aware of them, or if you're a farmer, you know. Um, here in the, in the contemporary U.S., we think of, of these worms as problems for pets, or, and if you're a farmer, you probably feed large quantities of medicine to, to your livestock to, to, uh, to, to address them. So these are worm, intestinal worms, um, but 1 billion people, 1.5 billion people in the world uh, have these. And they used to be a problem, actually, in the U.S. South as well. So we, uh, together with Ted Miguel, and um, uh, we we evaluated an the NGO's efforts to uh, treat the worms, and we found huge impacts on education. So we initially looked at a whole range of things in education. Um, some of them, you know, some of them didn't work, some of them worked, but in unexpected ways. Deworming had a phenomenal impact. It's extremely cheap. This costs pennies per dose. Um, it's safe. Um, so the World Health Organization recommends that in areas where there's high prevalence, 
go to the schools because this is highly prevalent among school kids and treat all, all the kids. So we looked at this and we, we found huge increases, one quarter of school absence, school, school absent went down, absence went down by one quarter. And later, by the way, we followed this and we found that uh, you know, girls were more likely to, to uh, finish the, to pass the primary school leaving exam, go on to secondary school. Uh, boys were working more hours after, as young adults. Uh, incomes went up. So um, the program paid for itself a hundredfold. Okay, so this was a, we, we were excited to find this, but the NGO had an approach of saying, well, we think everybody, every, we don't like giving away stuff for free. And so we're gonna charge for it. And so we talked to them, you know, we developed a relationship with the NGO and they thought, okay, look, we'll try it. We'll try, um, in, it, we'll try, um, we'll try in some schools continuing to give them away for free. And what they found was, there was a, I think it went from 75% uh, take up when uh, it was just the parents had to sign up to I think it was 17% with a very small fee. So that was one result in one context. But then there was additional work in many other contexts in looking at mosquito nets, uh, Pascaline Dupas at Stanford and Jessica Cohen, who's here at the School of Public Health in Harvard, found similar results. Uh, um, it, it, came, it showed up case after case. And meanwhile, there was exciting work going on in behavioral economics by, uh, by David Labson and, and Matt Rabin and, and many others who are here at Harvard as well as some people outside of Harvard. And uh, um, the, you know, one of the things that they were finding is that there's what's called present bias. People sort of focus on the present a lot relative to even just a short period later. And Putting these two, we were able to try to understand more that first this was a systematic phenomenon of underinvestment in preventive health. And second, we were able to, and I think research continues to go on in this area, we're not, we don't have all the answers, but it, there's reason to think that behavioral factors play a role in this and we're trying to tease that out. So since that period, there's been a huge change in policy in the world on public health issues across a variety of sectors um, that there's much less, uh, much less attempts to charge for, say, mosquito nets or, or other uh, preventive health. It did work on water, water treatment, same thing. So that's an example of not, we learned about one particular thing, and you can't, obviously you can't generalize a result by, like that by saying, let's subsidize deworming medicine. You don't want to do that in Canada where there aren't a lot of worms, but probably in Canada, you know, there are, I don't know what the public health issues are in Canada, but, uh, um, I'd be willing to bet that on preventive health, people in Canada are, are, uh, are, are not, I know, certainly know for myself, I'm not doing all the preventive health things that I should do. Um, so, um, so that's one type of lesson. Let me, I've been talking a while, let me say something about China and then you know, happy to take more questions. So China, I've been learning a bit about China uh, recently, I know very little, so take this with a grain of salt. But China doesn't do many RCTs. <laughs> But China does a ton of experimentation compared to m really any other country I know. They, they, when they are thinking about a new policy, they'll typically try it in a particular region of China first. And then, depending on the results, they'll either roll it out to the next level and then do a second wave of, of testing, or they you know, roll it out you know, further. And often there are many waves of this before they roll it out nationally. And you know, I don't want to claim that China's, uh, that that's the main reason why China's grown. You know, there are many, many reasons. Uh, international openness, uh, a system of decentralization combined with, uh, with um, incentives for local party leaders to, to, um, to achieve centrally set objectives, which were economic growth over a lot of this period, and more recently, an emphasis on trying to fight poverty, and obviously all sorts of political things uh, um, that, but, um, but you know, I do think that experimentation has been part of uh, what's helped China grow. It's not RCTs, and I think, you know, love to have a separate discussion about what are the, in what cases is it okay not to have a very carefully defined control group, and in what cases is it important to have a, a carefully thought through control group? Uh, but they, they certainly do a lot of experimentation in China. Um, 
Awesome. Uh, uh, thank you so much for your time and for being here, Michael. Uh, I had another question on behalf of the audience that was submitted earlier. Uh, the audience was wondering if you could share share some advice on uh, on choosing on choosing topics and coming up with groundbreaking ideas for for research topics. Uh, I would, you know, one so. When I'm talking to people who are interested in a senior thesis or to graduate students looking for a research topic, I would say choose something that you care about and that's important. I, I, that care about could be this uh, puzzle that you just can't get out of your head and you, you want to try to solve. It doesn't have to be you care about uh, the mission or, or something like that, whatever motivates you. Because it's a lot of work to do research. And, um, and you, you should be, and you'll probably do a better job if you're doing something you care about. And the other thing, which is, I guess, you know, I've, I'm feeling, uh, it's one data point, but uh, people are often worried that, oh, I have to do what's gonna, what the market's going to want, and I can't, I have to do something that's gonna show off technical skills if, if it's a PhD student. Um, you know, it's, I think if you do what you're interested in, it pays off in the end. And I guess I'm feeling uh, <laughs> like I'm super fortunate in that because <laughs> um, uh, it's doing that now. So I would say work on what you think is important, um, work on what, you, what, you know, what motivates you. And that's, just to be clear, that doesn't mean don't get advice from people. Definitely get advice from people, particularly at a place like here, you can get a ton of advice. The other thing I would say is you have to be open to redefining that over time. You know, I often feel that, the, my, the, for me, the most exciting experiences in research are when I've done a paper thinking it's about one thing and then realizing, no, this is about something totally different. And that happens you know, time after time. So try to be open to what the, if it's an empirical project, try to be open to what the data is saying. And to the, if it's a theory project, um, you know, it's the same thing. So. Um, so my question is, because uh, you have managed to um, use RCTs to scientifically measure the effectiveness of specific policy intervention, like dewarming, mm -hmm. my question is, can we apply the same scientific rigor of RCTs to answer the big, some of the big policy questions, like whether free trade helps or hurt poor countries, or whether free capital mobility is good or bad for development? Right. Great. Thank you. So first, let me be you know, completely clear about this. I don't think that RCTs can be used to answer every question. And you know, economics or social science more generally uh, requires a, a whole set of tools. And I think the tools that, the tools that, you know, that, those tools are constantly evolving and improving and we're adding new things to it. And you know, whether that's uh, you know, adding game theory to, to economics, which hadn't been part of economics, or, or developments in international trade. You know, all of those things are, it's, I think we're improving along a host of dimensions. And, um, the, um, but one other thing that's turned out to be the case is that um, we are finding that RCTs are applicable to shed light on questions that we might have thought we couldn't shed light on. So um, let me take the exam an example from international trade. Um, there's, been, yeah, there's, there's been a view, so again, this is going to be sort of the intellectual things that you can get out of RCTs, um, as opposed to we necessarily have a practical policy. So one, one view in, in trade has been that it's important to export, uh, because in the process of exporting, you learn things. You learn things about, about what the customers want, about how to uh, produce better. And that's an important, that's an argument. There's a big debate in, in, in economics between, the, uh, within development economics, but more broadly. Um, does it make, should governments sort of stay out of the way in trade, or should they actively intervene? And people who want governments to actively intervene often argue that there's a learning effect of trade and that that learning isn't entirely captured by the firm that's exporting and that therefore it's, it's worth subsidizing this because other firms will, will benefit and ultimately the population will benefit. And it's been, I may not be completely up to date on the latest literature, but economists have spent a lot of time trying to look for these effects and had 
remarkable difficulty finding them or, or proving this. Well, there was a recent paper in Egypt um, where they worked with ex, uh, firms that were producing carpets and exporting them. And they, or sorry, mostly producing them not for export, actually. But then they worked with exporters, and they got the exporter to choose suppliers and to, to uh, introduce some element of, of randomization into that so that you could then isolate the impact of this. And, in, and indeed, they found evidence that aiming for a foreign market allowed the, the, the uh, carpet manufacturers to upgrade um, and, and uh, led to production improvements. So that's, some, you know, that's an example where it's not that we, the conclusion is, let's, uh, let's subsidize, subsidize exports of carpets. They were learning something more fundamental about, and I, you know, this is one study. I think there's more work to be done. But uh, it, does, it, do, it is shedding light on a debate in, in you know, broader, a much broader policy debate, in this case, one involving international trade and, and, uh, and perhaps a macroeconomic policy. So, yes. Oh, sorry. My name is Aban Punjwani. I'm a senior in the college studying economics. Thank you so much, Professor Kramer, for your time. Um, your work is truly an inspiration to millions across the world. Um, my question is, what are some open questions in development economics that you believe the next generation of both academics and practitioners will work on and solve? Right. You know, one thing that, uh, that economists have been pretty shy of, about working on is, um, is you know, issues of culture. And I think our, our tendency is to assume people are people everywhere and there, you know, there aren't that. You know, we can just look at the fundamental uh, economic forces of supply and demand or things from game theory. They're going to work the same everywhere. There's you know, exciting work going on in economic history and, uh, and more broadly um, to try to understand how you know the role of uh, the role of culture, and um, that is um, so. My colleague Nathan Nunn does a lot of that work. Alberta Alcina, um, and you know that often obviously involves bringing in insights from other disciplines, and I think that's an exciting area, um, and uh, one you know one of many exciting areas. I think there's a you know it's been fantastic that um, that I. You know, obviously very excited about the movement towards uh, randomized trials, but economic theory is very important, and work to uh, work on economic theory or the macroeconomics of, of development are also very important areas, and I hope there'll be more work in those areas as well. Hi, um, I'm Amy Yi. I'm the journalist who wrote about your work in, in um, in the New York Times, I wrote about the deworming campaign in Delhi, and I got to see this happening on the ground. It was the most awesome thing to see children lined up to get the deworming pills, so it was awesome. Um, so um, I'm at the Kennedy School this year, which is great. Um, so a um, couple things. Um, you know, economics, RCTs, uh, you know, now they're very, um, it's very glamorous, um, especially with the Nobel Prize. Um, what's not so glamorous are the people on the, on the ground, the NGO workers who work really hard to implement these programs, mm -hmm. um, really difficult to do this work. Um, so one question is, um, do you think that, um, what, what do you think could make their work easier on the ground. Um, the other question is that sometimes these programs don't persist, um, so I don't know the status of that program in Delhi, and a lot of that depends on the political um, institutions and who's in, who's in politics at the time. So I don't know if the program in Kenya is still going on. If it is, that's wonderful. But um, do you, can you say something about how to keep these programs going and uh, to get politicians and policymakers to um, institutionalize these programs? Let me take the second part of that first. Um, so, um, well, let's give a little bit of background. Good to connect again, by the way. Um, the, um, the, so, so, as I mentioned, I was involved in a study of, uh, of the effects of deworming. We found you know, big impacts. We found huge price sensitivity. Um, the, took those results, went to the permanent secretary, that's sort of the top civil servant, under a 
the Kenyan system of government or any uh, many system of government in most countries, there's a, uh, a top civil servant who's, who's there permanently, even though the uh, ministers would change. Uh, so there's many more. Uh, it's not like the US government where there's a ton of, of political appointments at the top. So I um, so met with the permanent secretary, um, explained some of the results. They were very, he was very excited about it. He really wanted to move forward with us. But uh, they weren't able to move forward with it between you know, that year and, and uh, the next time I was in Kenya. And you know, that went on for a while. And why was that? Well, that was because if you're permanent secretary of the Ministry of Education, you have a lot of issues to deal with. And, um, and they, there were teacher strikes. There were you know, other terrible crises in Kenyan education. And Ministry of Education had a thin staff. At the top of it was excellent. But you know, that wasn't necessarily the case all the way through. And so was able just to give a sense of, of you know, the process of, of, of how. You know, there was a lot of realize that there was a, a process of, of trying, to, um, trying to work with the government um, and to facilitate uh, progress on this. And that was partly working with civil servants and technical assistance. So some, some of the NGO workers who had successfully done this at the NGO were seconded to go work with the ministry. And they, they, uh, and they, they talked about how the, the local program was done and worked out the many, many details of, of non-glamorous work, exactly as you said, of, of what's necessary to scale this up. And that included everything. I mean, some, maybe some bits were glamorous. There were non-glamorous bits, like figuring out which parts of Kenya had worms and which didn't by going through a bunch of studies and then matching those up to the different, the changed district boundaries so you could figure out how many worm, how many pills you're going to need, what the training, the logistics of the training was going to be, prepare a document for the finance section of the Ministry of Education that they can consider, and if they like it, then they'll pass it up to the finance ministry, and then it'll be considered by, uh, through the Kenyan government process. I see Awesome nodding his head because, the, you know, I've done work in the U.S. government, with the U.S. government as well. It's the same, same thing. There's a bunch of steps that have to be, have to be undertaken before something can become a, a reality. So, there's also getting political support for this. And so you know, it was able to meet with some senior Kenyan politicians, including the prime minister at the time, Raila Odinga, but also with ministers who came from different political parties, but were willing to come together to, there was a, there's a, Kenya's got a lot of coalition politics. So these were rival parties, even though they were both part of the government. But they came together and they made a joint announcement about this. So the combination of the civil servants and the, and the and the ministers, that led to change. And Kenya implemented a national program. And I should say, they implemented that program, and the donors supported it, by the way. Um, but then the whole, it was part of a larger program. There's corruption scandal in parts of the larger program. Everything shut down again. Um, again, I'm seeing Nassim smiling. This is, that's part of you know, policy. But then it took a lot more work, and then they were able to launch that program, to launch the deworming component of the program again. In India, um, the, um, you know, the, so we also did a lot of work to try to get the results out there, not just in journals, but they were you know, in the World Bank World Development Report, for example, and the US Economic Report of the President. So that, that um, partly as a result of that, Indian state governments started exploring this as well. And Kenyans who had worked in the Kenyan program traveled to India to explain how they set it up and how it could be done. And you know, they worked out, the Indian state governments worked out implementation uh, approaches. And then India launched uh, st a bunch of, a bunch of, one state launched in India and then other states followed. Um, and then the national government in India followed. And let me emphasize, you know, neither the, you know, I don't want to claim that, I don't, uh, that either the you know, current Kenyan government or the current Indian government are, you know, that they're, uh, that they're you know, completely, uh, um, you know, that they're immune to political considerations. Maybe that's the way, way to put it. Um, but, you know, that doesn't, and that doesn't mean uh, that they're not willing, if there's something that, that is very inexpensive that they can do that's going to be, you know, maybe it's going to actually get them some votes that they won't go ahead and, and do that. Um, and you know, in each case, I'm very happy to say both of these programs are continuing. 
And you know, I think more than uh, 150 million kids are, being, are getting treatment for worms uh, every year as a result of just those two programs. Um, so this can, you know, that, that's maybe an example of, you know, you can learn some broad scientific lessons and that's really important. You can also, and that can shape our general understanding of policy, you know, um, but there are also, you know, particular programs and when they prove effective, you know, even if you don't have complete wholesale uh, uh, political nirvana, um, you can, um, you, you, often their politicians can make that, and civil servants can make this happen and do. Oh, yes. Yes, so, you know, I, I think that's, that's, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, this is not the type of research that can be done by, by you know, an, an individual or a few individuals. It requires huge teams of people working together, and that very much, and it also requires, you know, the early, the, I'll, I'll mention, you mentioned NGO workers. I'll talk both about NGO workers and about survey enumerators. You know, NGO workers uh, have to, you know, NGO workers are off, you know, th they're doing very difficult jobs. We're starting to actually, there's now some RCTs on what, how, what motivates them and, and, uh, and how to get better performance, and you know, maybe others can, can talk about that. But there's, the work that they do is very important, and I particularly would like to recognize some of the the NGO that um, that I worked with, uh, ICS. You know, it was a brave uh, decision in some ways by the by the you know, leader of that NGO at the time, named Chip Barry, to say, "Hey, you know, I don't actually know all the answers. I'm not going to assume that I've got the right answer. I'm actually going to try different things and try to learn about what works." And uh, you know, that's that that decision has had big consequences. The other group is the survey enumerators. And anybody who's worked in this area know you don't write a survey and then just implement it. You'll be asking all the wrong questions. There'll be, uh, you'd learn a lot from your super survey enumerators and as a researcher, and that goes into producing much better research. And you know, one, it's a side comment, but I guess I get to make these comments now. Um, uh, um, you know, in medicine, papers have you know, 27 authors on them. In economics, we're used to three authors. You know, maybe we should be following medicine and, and you know, more broadly recognize the, uh, the many people who go into any paper. I thank you, Michael. And uh, this is following up. Just now you described the collaboration and communication between researchers and policymakers and local government. Um, so um, I'm fr a doctoral student from Graduate School of Education. As a so social science researcher, sometimes we bump into a situation where researchers are very enthusiastic, whereas the policymakers and the real world are not that enthusiastic. Yeah. However, we do believe the importance of our topic. So would you mind sharing some experiences um, not only as an established researcher, um, but also your experience developing from a junior researcher to um, an established scholar. What the challenges and experiences, if you could share with us, um, how to convey the messages from the research side and how to build the collaboration like you described um, with policymakers, especially under current um, political climate. Yeah. Um so there's, I think, a, a process of dialogue between the researchers and policymakers is, is very important. Uh, often, you know, researchers, you know, junior or senior, they get very enthusiastic about things. And there's a, and policymakers, probably correctly, often want to be cautious. Um, there's, um, I understand that, LSE, they're now teaching a course for graduate students um, on how to improve their behavior when interacting <laughs> with, uh, with policymakers, and I think that's a, you know, a very valuable. Um, you, know, you, you can't go in like you know everything um, you know, for two reasons. One, you're gonna offend people if you do that, and two, you don't know everything, and the policymakers probably do know something. And so, um, and, you know, you'll, you'll get good ideas from that. Um, if I if I um, you know, if I think about um, you know, my my own experience, um, you know, let me just you asked for early. I'll just say a, a more recent uh, 
uh, story. I'm, you know, I'm doing, doing some work in Colombia and talking to the policymakers there in their, um, in their student testing agency. And they're very concerned uh, because a lot of, same problem in the, in the US, there's a, a rapid gro a growth of for-profit higher education and a very heterogeneous quality. And a lot of, um, a lot of students are, are not, they're choosing without a lot of information. They're the first in their, the first in their family to go on to higher education. I'm not talking about you know, making the wrong decision between Brown and Michigan. I'm talking about making, you know, they're choosing between, should I be an x-ray tech? Those people who are choosing between Brown and Michigan, they're not perfectly informed, but they've got a lot of information. The people who are choosing whether to be an x-ray technician or a dental technician, they often have very little information to go by. And there are people who are setting up schools to rip them off. And the, you know, trying to provide some of that information is very important. And this is something that the National Student Loan Agency in Colombia is, is very, you know, very concerned about. And, you know, sorry, obviously the Student Loan Agency is very concerned about it because they don't want the bad debt. But the Student Testing Agency and the Ministry of Education, this is, so I recently went to Colombia and I, a few years ago, and I went trying to talk about some research that I'd done on school choice and found that the policymakers wanted to talk about this other problem and realized that was a very important problem and one where you know, we could potentially make progress. So I'm hoping that we will, uh, you know, the policies actually, we talked and the policies moved ahead and I'm hoping that we'll be able to do some exciting research as well. Um, they're doing some very exciting things there that you know, uh, I hope will be useful for millions of students in Colombia, but I think could have, you know, maybe could eventually be adopted by other countries. I think, by the way, let me just say, I think the whole area of, and the approach uses technology and chatbots to try to communicate with students. And I think the whole idea of digital development, you know, it's easy to get, obviously there's gonna be a lot of, of failures as well, but I'm also working on dig providing information digitally on agriculture through an, uh, an NGO I helped found with a, uh, Sean Cole, who's at the business school, as well as a number of uh, Dan Bjorkegreen, who was a grad student here, is now at Brown, and uh, uh, Heiner Baumann, who uh, comes from a, a, a business uh, background. Um, but the, the, um, the, we're working now with governments in, many, in mu multiple countries and reaching millions of farmers with new ways of trying to convey agricultural information. So those, those are two examples, but I think there's a, you know, when people were asking before what are areas for the future, I guess I focused on the sort of more academic side of it, but from the policy side and from the research side, there's a lot that can be done in digital development and, um, and lots of opportunities there. Hi, Professor Michael. This is a question from the second floor. So could you elaborate a bit more for the potential for the cross-disciplinary collaboration in the international development field, especially for public health and economics? Because RCT, the idea is originate from medicine, and as you said, behavioral economics and the public health, the field has lots of have already shared a lot of works, and what might be the open topics or opportunity window for the cross-disciplinary collaboration in these two fields? I have this question because I'm a grad student in School of Public Health, and mm -hmm. I'm interested in this topic. Thank you. Um, so I think there's all sorts of exciting opportunities. Let me, let me you know, um, Awesome was referring to uh, global public good. So I, I don't know whether I would say this is a global public good, but um, but um, you know, one of the in my in my spare time, one of the things that I've been involved in is helping a U.S. agency for international development create a a, a unit um, called Development Innovation Ventures, which um, supports innovation. And I think you know one of the things I've been arguing today is that. This area is one, a lot of the work is about innovation. And so, and they're very, you know, Development Innovation Ventures is, is focused on innovation. So what, what Development Innovation Ventures does is it takes applications, it could be from a social entrepreneur, could be from a, a, um, a, a mayor somewhere, uh, could be from a researcher to, for innovative ideas. And it has, it has some funds to pilot the idea because before you can go to a RCT, you want to pilot the idea. As if, you, if, it, if the pilot works out, you can go to a second stage of, 
of rigorous testing. And then for the th most successful things, there's greater funds available to try to transition things to scale. So I'll just give an example of, of one thing in the public health area that I think really is interdisciplinary. Um, there were, um, this actually came from a couple of researchers in, at Georgetown, James Habirimana, who was a student here, um, um, and uh, Billy Jack. And so what they, they so you know, uh, James is from East Africa, and if you spend time in East Africa, you'll know that there's lots of minibuses and they drive like crazy because they, they, the drivers pay a fixed amount, fixed rent to the owner, and if they don't make that much, they lose money at the end of the day, and if they make you know, $7 more, they go home with $7. So if they, um, so the idea was just put a sticker in the, in the minibus for the passengers to see, saying, if you're feeling uncomfortable, slow down. And that, that sounds like a somewhat crazy idea, but DIV provided a small grant to them. They actually came in with some evidence. They'd, they'd done a small RCT, had a few problems, but they'd done an RCT. It looked very promising, the results. They then did, went back and redid things very carefully. Again, the sort of iterative approach that's key to innovation. And then they were able to demonstrate, and they actually published, their, their economists, but they published in uh, Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, showing, with data from insurance companies, showing a huge reduction in accidents. They then worked, they then applied for a, a, a further grant to help them transition this to scale. And for that, they worked with the insurance companies on the one hand, so for, sort of a private sector uh, element to the scaling, and the insurance companies you know, wanted the, the minibuses to be safer. Um, so the largest insurance company in Kenya signed up. And then on the other hand, with the government, um, to, so that when people renewed their licenses, um, they, had to, um, they had to put in, in stickers. So this is one example, but there are many of, of things that um, DIV has supported which have, have scaled up. And I think what, you know, this is, you know, several of them are actually health examples. Um, so I, I don't want to predict what the next idea is, precisely because that's not an idea. You know, if you'd asked me about that idea, I would have said, it's not going to work. <laughs> Luckily, you know, it did work. And, um, and that's, I, I think that trying to have resources, and, and DIV does this, to, to try out new ideas, to rigorously test them, and then to take the most successful to scale, um, I think that's a, a very powerful approach. And, um, and I think that there are probably lots of examples in health and lots of examples trying to bring in ideas from, from multiple disciplines. Dr. Kramer, thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, down here. Hello. Yes, hi. <laughs> Uh, I'm a student at the Harvard Kennedy School, and I'm interested in the relationship between research and program implementation. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, your work has shown us that randomized control trials have, amendous, have tremendous capacity to give us insights about very complex behaviors and decision making. But as we've seen this methodology applied in different contexts to different challenges, it's also clear that randomized control trials are expensive to run, logistically challenging to coordinate, and the most effective ones take a long time to measure results longitudinally. My question to you is, how can we convince skeptical policymakers that this diagnostic effort is worth it when so many policymakers are under pressure to deliver results quickly and at scale? Yeah, so I think that, so you know, first, I think that often they are expensive and difficult to run, but sometimes they're not always expensive and difficult to run. So for example, in this uh, agricultural context, um, if some outcomes, you know, if you want to see what the impact is on yields, you're going to have to wait a season, no question. But if you, you can also do A-B tests, and maybe you're, this is an interactive voice system, and your measure, which you can get very, very quickly, is you try one approach, you try another, do people do people drop off the line immediately or do they stay on the line? So that's, that's, some, that's almost the, the opposite. It's like the type of A-B test that Google or Facebook would do where they get results very quickly and, and very cheaply. Uh, but I take your broader, broader point. Um, the, so I think that one of the, when a policy, I think a key thing to recognize is that when a policymaker try, decides, and some of them aren't gonna wanna do it, some of them will, 
But when a policymaker says, I'm going to give this a try, they're creating knowledge not just for themselves, but much more broadly uh, for the world as a whole. And that means that's, you know, I think why Awesome used the phrase global public good. It's, and that means that we should, in terms of our, our, the way we set up our institutions, you know, one, one of the reasons why I mentioned development innovation ventures is you shouldn't expect the policymaker, if a policymaker in, in Ghana says, I want to try this, to expect Ghana to, let's say this is an expensive RCT. Um, um, by the way, just to be clear, you know, these expensive RCT might cost a million dollars. That would be on the high, many of these are a couple of hundred thousand dollars. If, if you were talking about affecting billions of dollars of spending, uh, this is small relative to that. But it might be a lot relative to what that policymaker can easily do. So having some central source of funds that's available, like from DIV, but you know, World Bank or DFID or many other organizations uh, um, are now starting to provide that. Um, I think that can be very valuable. I think there's a lot of scope for, for more of these innovation, social innovation funds. And um, certainly when we, we did a study looking at the rate of re social rate of return to the investments in development innovation ventures, what the US you know, taxpayers put into it, and we're finding benefits five times as great as the cost. And that's a super conservative methodology. So I think this is, you know, this is an area where um, you know, governments and, and philanthropists they're trying to encourage more experimentation like this and support the, those policymakers who are, who are willing to undertake it uh, is very valuable. Uh, so I, I know we were supposed to end at uh, 6.30, so we're, we're hitting pretty close to that time. What we'll do is we'll take two more questions um, from the audience, and then I requested Michael if he could you know, stay around for another 10 minutes or so. You guys can walk up if you want to meet my, you know, some question which you didn't feel like asking publicly, you can ask him. Uh, I know he has to go to a dinner, so I'm, I'm respectful of his time as well. But why don't we take last two questions from the audience and then another 10 minutes. Thank you for your time, Professor. Uh, my name is Satish and I'm a junior studying economics. My question is about, the, uh, about RCTs as a method. It seems pretty clear and convincing that uh, RCTs are uh, an extremely powerful tool in answering the question, does X cause Y? But could you elaborate on how RCTs can be helpful in actually understanding the black box of why X causes Y? Sure, very much so. And I think a lot of research is, is doing that and is aimed at that. So often when you find an initial result, then you can, you can design you know, further work to try to elucidate the mechanisms. And that's you know, very standard right now. Let me think of a, I'll, I'll give an example. Um, you know, this is work that, um, work that was done on, um, um, let, let me give an example from education um, um, and talk about, um, about sorry, I, I, I forget how much <laughs> I talked about textbooks already, but you know, we found that the, um, we had a program in which textbooks were provided and we found that those were not, um, that this was in Kenya where I had taught, and we found that the average test scores in the school didn't go up. And you know, we stared at the um, results for a while, and I was actually you know, pretty shocked because even people who are skeptics about more resources for education typically think that textbooks are gonna make a difference. And we then, having spent time teaching in Kenya, I suddenly a light bulb went off and I thought, hey, these kids are learning in their third language. School's taught in English once you get to uh, even past the first few grades in Kenya. That's most kids' third language. Um, they're missing a lot of school from, you know, from worms, they're from, from malaria, from a their parents having HIV, um, they're and needing to take care of their siblings and so on. Their teachers are missing school often. It's very easy to fall behind. And then once you fall behind, if the curriculum's just marching ahead, and Kenyan schools are very much focused, like many developing country schools, it's not no child left behind. It's, you know, we care about our star performers, and we want the, the, we want the person who's gonna make it to university and, and uh, come back with a good job, and that's the goal of the, and the entire education system is structured around that. So if you fall behind, it's very hard to catch up. So we said that was a hypothesis that maybe most kids couldn't weren't in a position where they could necessarily benefit from the textbooks. So how do you, first thing we did was we looked within our, within our data and we saw 
that the kids who scored well on the pretest were more like, they, they did not see an impact. But the kids who were in the top quartile of the distribution saw actually a big benefit, suggesting the kids at the top of the distribution could benefit from the textbook. Some effect at the second quartile, but when you averaged it all together, you weren't seeing much. So that was a clue about what the mechanism that was driving this apparently mysterious result, that textbooks aren't making a difference. You know, this was a place where there was you know, one textbook for every 14 students, I believe, at the beginning. So then th that's, you know, that was one step. But then additional was wor work was done. So uh, Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee and Sean Cole and Lee Linden did work in India on remedial education. And what they found was that kids who've fallen behind can actually be brought up quite quickly to a point where they can then benefit from the, the class uh, instruction overall. So that's, it. and that sort of more, you know, tested that hypothesis further. And since then, there's been a bunch of work on, on trying to actually have adaptive instruction, for example, with technology, to see if, if by adapting, you know, targeting instruction to where the kid is can, can have an impact. So we're seeing you know, development over time to understand the why and to use that understanding to uh, improve uh, people's opportunities so they can fulfill their potential. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the evening, Professor. Um, my question is, uh, as much as this new field of economic understanding, uh, RCTs, brings to the frame a more empirical, thus scientific and effective method of understanding what enables growth in the poor nations, the question, the problem of accountability seem to persist. Is the impetus of alleviation of global, uh, global property relies on the shoulders of selfless econo economists or maybe careerist globalists? Or is another way of ensuring accountability on these development programs possible, especially of the accounts of impo impoverished themselves? Um, so again, let me be clear, you know, I think you know, economists are going to have, I hope we can have a useful role, but I don't want to claim it's, it's more than that. Um, the, um, um, you know, much like any other professional, uh, you know, a, a doctor can be useful for their patients, but they're not going to, and a, a, a medical researcher may make progress on a particular issue, but, you know, that's, they're, they're much larger issues that are, um, but I, so, you know, the, People ask me who's made the most difference to world poverty. It's clearly, I mean, in my view, it's very clearly Deng Xiaoping, you know, because the, the fundamental reforms to China that Deng Xiaoping introduced led million, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. So, but that said, you, know, you raise the issue of accountability. This is an area where, again, it turns out RC, I would never, you know, I started doing work on textbooks, you know. <laughs> I, I shy away from, you know, super politically controversial topics, but, you know, other people aren't so shy. And, uh, and um, you know, there's really exciting work on accountability that very small, again, there are big problems of accountability that go, you know, I, I don't want to claim that, uh, that research is going to save the world here, but um, give an example. In Indonesia has a, pro, a big uh, uh, anti-poverty program, provides a lot of benefits to, to uh, Indonesian citizens in poverty. But a bunch of it doesn't get through because of corruption. And so the, there were people in the Ind Indonesian government who were sincerely concerned about this problem. They talked to uh, researchers, uh, including uh, Rima Hanna here at Harvard and, and Ben Olkin at MIT. And they, they, what they decided to try was Let's let the people who are entitled to receive these, uh, these, uh, this anti-poverty benefit, let's let them know about it. And they saw that led to a 30% increase in the amount of food that was getting to people. So that's a huge, you know, that very simple step improve, improved accountability. Um, there are other examples that are, you know, go even more, more deeply. There's work um, um, in which, um, in which, um, voters were provided with uh, simple report cards, giving them some information. Or a graduate student recently did work where to let uh, uh, citizens in India l know about the criminal record of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of people running for office. That led to substantial changes and in, in substantial improvements. Um, there's work even on what's the impact of, of debates. Um, so in some constituencies in Sierra Leone, uh, an, organ an NGO sponsored debates, and they saw that led to more uh, cross people voting across ethnic lines. 
So there's a lot of interesting work on exactly this issue of accountability. And some of it, I think, um, uh, I'll give another DIV example. There was a study to try to reduce some types of uh, fraud in counting of votes. And that was, uh, that was scaled up um, by uh, actually one of the political campaigns in Afghanistan. And you know, that, that, um, that reached millions of people. So uh, there's exciting research going on in this. And I think it's actually improving. It is improving accountability already. Uh, great. Um, so uh, with that, I think, sadly, we'll have this to keep going on. But um, each time I listen to Michael, I learn something new. I did want to mention kind of two, two observations just to reiterate what Michael said. And I think it's important to recognize this year's Nobel really celebrates those two things. And Michael said this, but I want to emphasize them again. The first is this idea of research meets practice. You know, when I first came as a junior faculty member, there used to be this idea that you could either be a researcher or you could be a practitioner. I, I'm at the Kennedy School, and so this, this kind of dichotomy was always there. And I think what this Nobel has done in many ways for our field, but I hope for development in general, has kind of made it clear that you don't have to have this trade-off. You don't have to have this dichotomy. You could actually be very much in the world of practice, as Michael is, and at the same time reach the highest honor that an academic can, which Michael has. And so that's, that's something deeper than just RCTs or not RCTs or anything like that. And I think that's really worth thinking about, emphasizing. And also, for you students out there, you don't have to face this kind of trade-off or this tension. You may have different weights in these two areas, but the fact that they can coexist, and not just coexist, but complement and support each other is a really powerful message. The second message, which I think is equally as important, and this is something when you hear Michael, you hear Esther, you hear Abhijit. In fact, you, you should have heard when Michael talks about his work, what I find fascinating is how many times he's talking about other people's work. Right? This idea that what we're producing is not a singular production. It's not some person in an office having this brilliant epiphany, which a lot of Nobels are, and hats off to them. But this is a collective production by a whole bunch of people, some of whom are in the room standing here, some are in the audience, and some are frankly, and most in fact, are out there in the world in places that we really, truly, deeply care about. And I want to make sure we recognize that aspect of this joint production, because that's another message as we produce work uh, about how we think about that work. And Michael said this earlier, the fact that when we approach individuals, and you know, Harvard is a place of privilege, right? You can think of that privilege as let's pat on our back, each of us on our backs, or you can think of this as a point of responsibility, uh, as something you can take to the world. But when you take it to the world, Michael said this earlier as well, is you go with a sense of humility and a sense of learning from the world, not just teaching the world. And that's a critical thing. And again, you know, all of these are things that I notice about Michael when he speaks, and I can't help reiterating them in case, I'm sure you pick them up, but I want to emphasize these things are, are critical. Um, as you leave, uh, like I said, we have another 10 minutes or so. Feel free to come up, um, say hi to Michael. Uh, um, the other thing I'd request you to do is, I'm struck listening to all of you, which is why I said introduced from where you are. We've had a range of people in this room. Um, the one thing which is worth doing is turn around and look at the person who you don't know and you didn't come up with as you leave and just ask them what they're doing. You would be amazed at the wealth of knowledge and expertise and experience here. And you should at least, if we believe in the message we're talking about core learning from each other, take that opportunity to call in from each other as you exit. Thank you so much for being here. It's a real honor. Thank you, Michael, for being here. Thank you very much.